<laughs> Good morning, ladies, of, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, first of all, to the conveners for this lovely chance to present our work. It is, of course, a team effort with my colleagues and friends Ali Karesh and Klaus Regenauer Lieb, and we looked into the origin of a quite intriguing fault with the high fluid overpressures which formed, which was encountered in Australia's uh, most important and most famous hot dry rock reservoir. And we argue that this might be a new target for geothermal exploration. So if you have a look at Geoscience Australia's temperature map of the continent right here, you see a big red dot in the southeast, which is roughly at the, the border of uh, Queensland and South Australia. And right there, anomalously high temperatures are encountered at, um, at depth. If you extrapolate it, they, they reckon that at five kilometers depth, you reach roughly 270 degrees, 280. We know from wells in, into this region that at four kilometers, we encounter roughly 240 uh, degrees uh, Celsius. And uh, this thermal anomaly is actually due to the presence of carboniferous granites with anomalously high heat production. And uh, the granite that we are interested in is located here, right next to a little outback town called Inaminka. You can see it's a fairly large beast with a long axis extent of roughly 50 kilometers. And because of that high temperature anomaly here, it was targeted for, the, uh, for geothermal energy over the last 10 years by Geodynamics Limited in Australia. So and they drilled into that beast. Um, it's overlying by three sedimentary basins. Here's the top of the granite at, at roughly 3.8 kilometers depth. And when they drilled through it, they encountered this fairly large fault here back then for historical reason called the main fracture and a few other minor faults on top of it. And interestingly, this beast um, did not breach uh, the brittle sedimentary lid of the system. And uh, most notably, they found really high fluid overpressures in there. So drilling into it, water, hot water spurred it out, overpressures of order 30 megapascal. And it turns out that the fluid is most likely derived from the granite itself because it is enriched in cesium and lithium. And some chlorine isotopes seem to suggest that there's little or no connectivity to meteoric waters. The geometry of that fault can be revealed if you look at the spatial distribution of microseismic events associated with the stimulation, these here are data from a 2003 experiment. And the um, uh, color code here is time in days. I kicked out the first 50 days because during that time, stimulation only occurred very close to the well, which is here. But you can see that the fracture is fairly shallow and almost flat at its upper end. And, um, and that's where the cloud propagated first and, and then downwards at depth where it's like more or less uh, properly dipping as, as you expect. Here is now a, a plan view of uh, the, the same cloud and seismologists in interpreted this experiment as the stimulation of a pre-existing geological structure that is the fault itself. So they did not manage to actually fracture the surrounding fresh material. What is also noteworthy is that there is this fairly sharp cutoff at the upper terminus of the fracture here in the east. And we will argue that this is most likely a temperature, a, a thermal cutoff corresponding to the 230 degrees isotherm. However, the granite is massive and heterogeneous, so we cannot rule out that there are some other internal heterogeneities, such as big dikes or faults, that perhaps uh, uh, cause that type of effect. However, we don't see anything in, in geophysics, and it's quite uh, interesting that really nothing makes it across that boundary. A more recent stimulation experiment looked pretty much the same, so I'm not showing it here. So the following question arise. So how did this fluid bearing fault actually form and why does it not affect the overlying sedimentary lid, especially in the presence of such high fluid pressures? Why does the water come from below from the otherwise very dense and impermeable granite? And why is the pressure so high? And here's our hypothesis. We argue that this particular fault is actually brittle ductile in nature and that it is triggered and recharged by ductile shear zones that propagate upwards from below and extract fluid from the middle and lower crust via creep fractures. And we test this hypothesis with a 2D numerical continuum damage mechanics. This is a purely thermal mechanical experiment uh, fully coupled based on non-equilibrium thermodynamics. 
and we forward model the last five million years of the geological history of this particular granite. Before I go into the modeling, a quick word on creep fractures. Um, that's uh, something which has attracted a fair bit of attention in the last five or ten years or so. And it turns out that if you deform rocks in the ductile regime that usually involves some form of precipitation dissolution process, so ultimately a, a diffusion process, and if this is the case, you might form incompatibilities at grain boundaries, in particular during viscous grain boundary sliding. And such a phenomenon has been observed uh, fairly recently by Florian Fuseis, Klaus and colleagues in, in a hand specimen of the rat bank shear zone from central Australia. Here we see that little beast with the myelinitic shear zone at the bottom and some pre-existing gneiss right here. And if you look at the shear zone itself, you see massive grain size reduction. And the authors showed that this is due to diffusion creep. And then they went ahead and imaged voids, so porosity in the shear zone itself. And you see that there, these voids are arranged in sheets which decorate grain boundaries as revealed and confirmed here by SEM and that uh, leads to a local porosity increase in the shear zone itself. And this was interpreted as creep cavities which if they arrange themselves along grain boundaries can form macroscopic creep factors which in turn create a dynamic permeability rather than uh, a sustained static percolating pore network which is difficult at the high confining uh, stresses and temperatures in the middle crust. So these beasts have also been observed in laboratory experiments um, quite recently here, work of uh, Rybaki et al. And what is noteworthy in, in synthetic feldspar, what is important to point out here is that these beasts love to form at fairly high temperatures and low strain rates. And that's exactly the situation that we encounter in the Habanero granite. It's naturally high in temperature, and it's in a part of the Australian continent that is otherwise geologically quite boring. Not much has been happening there over the last um, uh, 10 million years or so. Of course, material scientists have been uh, aware of these beasts uh, for ages. Uh, if you uh, chuck that term creep fracture into a search engine, you find thousands of papers. And amongst them, of course, the seminal work of Cox and Ashby in the early 80s, uh, creep fractures are very common in ceramics and metals. So that's ultimately what inspired our notion that this could be an important um, mechanism for bringing fluids up and for creating these faults. So let's get into the modeling. Here's a little sketch that uh, shows our conceptual understanding of, of, of the particular area. So here is, is the granite itself with a little bit of an undulating surface. The upper part of it uh, turns out is fairly altered and enriched in heat producing elements so it's even a little bit hotter than that beast here and on top of it we have uh, three sedimentary basins sitting right here. Temperature is fairly high and outspurts the water here. And uh, we also know that um, this particular part of the world is subject to east-west compression, as will be shown in a minute. So here's some other assumptions. We assume that the material is not, much, uh, not very pre-damaged, and we know this is consistent with well image locks. We assume a thermal steady state, and that's, um, that's the granite uh, cover interface from, from geophysics. You can see it has these uh, sinusoidal perturbations, which we also included in the model. Here's the current stress uh, map of Australia and you see here in our neck of the wood we have um, east-west oriented uh, maximum uh, principal stress which is horizontal. We also know from geomorphological studies of the area that uh, it's been enjoying east-west shortening perhaps even over the last five to ten million years at this very low rate and this is indeed consistent with most of the fractures you observe in image logs and the large fault itself. So therefore, we set up our model as a 2D plane strain model here with, with, the, with the lower granite, this altered bit and the basins on top. Um, this is, uh, has been simulated with a finite element simulation, implicit integration, Lagrangian grid, and, and so on. So we've started with the thermal equilibration step and then applied a constant rate at, at one site and figured out what happens. So here this is just a, a cross-section, a vertical cross-section through the model to show that yes, our uh, thermal equilibration step actually matches the observed temperature field. So far so good. 
Um, and now the important part, the rheology that we employed here is elastoviscoplastic. It's a large strain formulation. We used additive rate decomposition and Yaumann spins. Uh, our more recent approaches are uh, quite advanced, so we also go hyperelastoplastic these days, but uh, fair enough. Elasticity for simplicity is isotropic and, and linear, and we got some well data and experimental data from the company for the basins and the granites themselves, which we put in. For the viscous part, we used an overstress formulation considering dislocation and diffusion creep with the usual flow laws. And here, for, um, for dislocation creep, we used the weak quartz flow law of Hearth et al. for diffusion creep and the Rutter and Brody thing. And uh, plasticity itself is formulated with an exponential yield envelope, which most notably is a function of the damage parameter and uh, pressure itself, so that beast flattens out to avoid convergence to infinity, but it turns out that for the material parameters of the granite in that range here, it looks pretty much linear like, like Mont Coulomb. Um, of course, it has no corners, so um, be it as it may. Now let's get to the important bit, the, the damage implementation, and we consider two processes, uh, the damage uh, nucleation due to surface diffusion and due to power law creep, which leads to the following uh, damage potential right here that has a growth and a nucleation term, which is quite important. And that's the Lemaitre damage force, which is probably familiar to most of you. And you can envisage this uh, damage parameter as a non-dimensional ratio of uh, damaged over undamaged material. It requires a critical equivalent plastic nucleation strain. Here we chose 0.5%, which is typical and effectively this damage, as you've seen in the previous equation, shrinks the yield envelope and leads to weakening. Finally, some results. So what is plotted here is the damage parameter itself. Remember that model is roughly 18 kilometers deep, then the material becomes so weak with the rheology that it's uh, decoupled from the bottom here. And you can see that after 300,000 years, the damage front starts to propagate upwards in a horizontal fashion. Sometime it starts to feel these sinusoidal perturbations of the granite topography. And as it approaches the brittle ductile transition, damage finally collapses into highly localized ductile, brittle ductile shear zone, which are arrested at the granite cover interface. And here's a zoom in of one of the troughs. In all cases, these shear zones localized in the troughs, they flatten out right here. Here you see the equivalent uh, Mises stress. Uh, and you can see that we sit right below the brittle ductile transitions and of course ahead of the tips of these beasts you cause crest, uh, stress concentrations in the brittle lid. So there are some limitations in this early set of models. We have not considered hydraulic and chemical processes. We can do so now as Manolis showed and have a whole set of, of tools and this leads to additional weakening feedbacks and these interesting cyclic instabilities. Um, the, the current models are, of course, also mesh dependent because we cannot resolve the brittle length scale, a classical problem. Um, however, we, we found that spacing is stable in other geometrical aspects. And there's the usual uncertainty regarding the geological history, material properties, internal heterogeneity, which ultimately results in our uncertainty of locating where the BDT actually is in nature. So impl implications, faulting is controlled by ductile damage uh, shear zones in this area, creep damage, always will propagate upward as a horizontal front and therefore provides a mean to extract large amounts of volume in a diffuse fashion from the middle and lower crust. Switch off rheology is probably due to switch off of ductile deformation mechanisms at the BDT. We can replicate the overpressure and intermittent ductile instabilities. And um, yeah, so ultimately, yes, the modeling seems to suggest that we can funnel fluids into these shear zones and we might even be able to explain some other interesting geophysical problems such as electrical resistivity and seismic reflectivity of the ductile crust. Some acknowledgements, thanks to Geodynamics who supported us in that work, CSIRO and the German Research Foundations. Thank you. Between brittle and ductile, or it's a continuous, or it's a domain, or 
Um, well, it, it, it evolves spontaneously as a function of the temperature field, the loading rate, and the distribution of the material properties. And if we go, can I go backwards somehow? Get, does that right click? No, sorry. If we go back to one, one. Thanks. Ah, that was the one. Yeah, thank you very much. So, simply, if you think about this in terms of the Christmas tree, you can see that the highest um, equivalent stress is, is reached there right above the granite cover interface. And we simply say that's the brittle ductile transition. So, but it's kind of point-wise. So, you actually do not consider the possibility of having a domain of finite extents where these two kind of uh, behavior may coexist in there. Oh, well, ultimately, the strain rate decomposition is ad additive. So whatever works best at the given conditions will actually work, and they all contribute to the equivalent strain rate at the same time, mm -hmm. the different rheological components. So mm -hmm. I would argue that the model indeed well, does do that. Uh, said, I mean, what we uh, notice is that there is a domain where you have equivalent ductile Any other questions from the audience? Well, it's not, then thanks a lot. Thank so you. We can move on.